We're doing Nehemiah, Rebuilding a Life for God. This is part eight. The title tonight is The High Cost, The High Cost of Free Renewing Grace. The High Cost of Free Renewing Grace. We're in Nehemiah chapter five. I have 13 verses that I'm going to read. Nehemiah 5.1. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. People with big families had more mouths to feed. Three. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. We need the money, selling them to slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it for other men have our fields and our vineyards. Nehemiah speaks. And I was very angry. When I heard their outcry and these words, I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you're exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not say a word. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations and our enemies? Nations are going to look and say, "You're, you're no different from us. 10. Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, oil that you have been exacting from them. And then they said, we will restore these. We will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. It's not very encouraging sounding. All the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Wow. These verses from chapter 5 are are more than just a dull detail about Jewish finance and bookkeeping. What we're witnessing in this chapter, in detail as it unfolds, these verses remind us about the cost of rebuilding these walls. True, we studied it. God had opened many doors, many miraculous things happened. But if the rebuilding work was to progress and thrive, there was a high price to be paid by by all the people. That's what this fifth chapter is all about. Let's get into it. Point number one. The high cost of rebuilding with the help of a gracious God. I, I think of the words of Jesus. When I read that text from Nehemiah 5, I think of the words of Jesus in Luke 14, 28 to 30. You know them. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not sit down first, count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And I'm reminded of those words from our text in Nehemiah, where Nehemiah says, the nations are going to see what you people are doing, and they're going to mock you. That's exactly what Jesus says here. Otherwise, 
The people will mock the man, saying he began to build and was not able to finish. So whether you're, here's the lesson. Whether you're building a tower or a wall or a life, you can't work just with an emotional excitement at the beginning of the project. Successful builders, according to Jesus at least, they always have this way of focusing on the end of the project. They, they concentrate on what it takes, not just to start something, not just to have a good idea, not just to hear God's voice, but to finish the work. They, they count the cost, Jesus says, and we see it in Nehemiah. They count the cost of the whole project, not just the beginning of the project. And, and those words, man, those words, and this example from Nehemiah 5, those words of Jesus could just be so well applied to the rebuilding of the walls in Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. The people, you'll recall from last week, they're over halfway done. The wall's up all around to a certain height. And they're just now facing the hard question. How much are these walls actually worth to us? How badly do we want these walls rebuilt? Walls are great, but, but at what price? At what cost? Those are good questions to ask, but, but they should have been asked at the start of the work. But now these questions were forced to the surface by some of the hard issues that were beginning to come obvious. It would be easy to argue that it was just too much sacrifice to get the walls back in place. You read it in the text. People were running out of food. There's a famine. There aren't resources. There aren't supplies ready at hand. Can't eat walls. <laughs> people couldn't run their farms. They couldn't plant their crops. Other people would take advantage and buy their land cheap. Force their children to work as slaves just to have something to eat. That's what's going on. People were suffering under the financial strain. The sacrifice of unpaid bills on their land. They couldn't harvest Crops for cash, and when push came to shove, these Jewish people, these people of God, who loved to see Nehemiah's prayer and devotion to God, they began to do crooked things to each other just to find a way of putting food on the table. No excuse, of course, for their wicked behavior. That's not my point. Nehemiah is going to confront them on that. You're going to see that in just a minute. But, but these events do still press home an important question. Where, where do I want the rebuilding presence and force and life of God's kingdom in my life? And, and how much do I long for some of those old things to become new again? Because, Don, make no mistake about it, there's a high price to that. That's what Jesus was getting at with that tower illustration. Everybody wants God to work, at least all Christians. We all want God to work in our lives, in our circumstances, in our families, in our situations. Everybody wants God to work. How badly do we want him to work? Marriages fall apart. Marriages never fall together. That part takes a whole bunch of work. You can pray, but then there's work. It takes more than nice thoughts to rebuild a home. It takes more than good intentions to get into a really solid powerful devotional life. You can't just dream about it. It'll cost something. 
There will always be a million good things, good things to keep people home from church. Cut it any way you want. Rebuilding, like those walls, like we're reading in chapter 5, it takes long, persistent work in the right direction. And I, and I just want to, here's, here's a life lesson. This is why it takes, couldn't God make it easier in all of these areas? Couldn't God just make it easy all the way into his kingdom? And the answer is yes, he could, but he chooses not to do it that way for this reason. God isn't out. God isn't out just to solve my problem. He's out to retrain my hungers toward holiness. He's out to transform the desires, change the desires, the affections, the choices, change those things that led me into the bondage in the first place. So he's not out just to change my circumstances. He's out to reform the inner part of my life. To teach me to want the right things, even when they're costly. To teach me to, he wants to reorganize my affections. So you read that fifth chapter of Nehemiah. You can't wish the walls up. You have to build them. Pick any area, growth and holiness, Christ-likeness, victory over habits of carelessness and sin. If it's going to become a reality in your life, transformation, then, then you need to be focused on it with real determination. This, more than anything else, is what Jesus meant when he described the blessed people who were pure in heart. Pure in heart simply means I'm focused on the spiritual aspirations that God has for me more than I'm focused on anything else. If I'm pure in heart, I don't fixate on anything else with equal devotion. If I'm pure in heart, I don't fixate on anything else with equal devotion to what God wants to do in my life and in my situation. When was the last time you met Christians like that? Point number two. The labor on the wall brought about internal strain and opposition. It's interesting. Chapter four that we looked at, it deals mainly with the opposition coming from the outside. Chapter five is totally different. It deals with internal opposition, internal problems. It describes a community starting to come apart at the seams just because of the financial pressure, the internal pressures, the grievances. That's what the first five verses are all about. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against the Jewish brothers. For there were many who said, with our sons and daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. So here's a single guy. You don't need as much, but I've, I've, got, I've got a big family. My needs are different. Three, there were also those who said, we're mortgaging our fields. It's great that we're putting the walls up, but I'm not working on anything else while we're putting the walls up, and I've had to sell my assets off. How am I going to live now? Just put walls up? You can see the strain starting to show. Four, there were those who said, we've borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and vineyard. We can't pay the taxes. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children as their children, skinny, gaunt, weak. Yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields, they have our vineyards. It's a mess. It's a mess. It's going to get better, but right now, is that, is that where you're at? It's great to have the promises. You know, I'm saved. You can think of when I got saved, that camp meeting, that altar, that church. Yes, it's going to be great when Jesus comes again. Blessed hope, that's wonderful. I love those times of worship in the church. And, but you should see my situation. It's, it's a mess. 
right where these people are at. The bottom line in all these details is that the people were using difficult times to do whatever they had to do, and they were behaving just like the nations around them. God had told them about charging interest, about slavery. They had the instructions. But boy, pressures of life can make you do things you, you wouldn't expect you'd do. Look at Deuteronomy 23, 19, and 20. You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but you may not charge your brother interest that the Lord that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you undertake, in the land that you are entering to possess it. Nothing could reveal the heart of God more in his commandments. You get When you're immature in the faith, you start to see his commandments as just restrictive. I want to do this, and God says, I can't. I have to do this, and I don't want to. Command, command, command. And, and, and if you don't have an understanding of this, that the Lord your God may bless you. Obey me. Why? That the Lord your God may bless you. It's also another passage that might have been on Nehemiah's mind. Let me just, is that Leviticus 25 text in your notes? If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him your food for profit. Okay, why not? Well, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and gave you the land of Canaan to be your God. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and a sojourner. He shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And you notice, why did I read all that? Deuteronomy 23, Leviticus 25. The reasons given for not charging interest or taking advantage are theological reasons. They're spiritual reasons. They weren't to do this because God wanted to be their God and God wanted the nations around to see that they behaved differently. He wanted there to be an observable difference. There were plenty of nations all around Israel who did whatever they had to do to survive. There were plenty of nations all around them who did take slaves, who did charge interest. There were people all around them who lived solely who lived solely to expedite their own desires. That's how they lived. There was no problem finding people like that. The world was full of people like that. In fact, everyone lived like that. But there was no revelation of God in lives lived like that. People would never see that God was a God of grace and a God of power. Now, finally, God wanted to raise up a people. They're building walls around the temple, their place of worship. God wanted to raise up a people who would not only be different, but would be seen by everyone around to be completely different. People were supposed to look at these Jews rebuilding the wall. People were supposed to look at them and say, how do those people live in this world? They don't seem to just live by their own desires. It almost looks like they're depending on someone else to defend their cause. It almost looks like they follow a totally different God and a different set of instructions. Exactly. Here are the ongoing lessons. I have just a few and then we'll wrap up. A. There will be times that are difficult, be times that are hard. It isn't enough just to be excited at the start. Things happen during the reconstruction process of a wall, of a tower, and of a life. A, the primary motive in all my decisions and in all my reactions is to be the glory of God. 
He must be seen to be obeyed and trusted in my life when it doesn't appear to be in my best interest to trust him. Did everybody get that? It is no exaggeration to say that this is the only true test of my witness in this world. Everyone else pursues what is immediately and obviously of benefit to himself. And there's nothing that stands out as a witness in a life like that. Here's the real issue. Do I obey God? Do I obey God even if others don't? Do I follow him when no one else thinks it's practical or comfortable? Do I use the lowering standards of everyone else in the church as my excuse for sloppy standards in my own life? It's easy to do. So this passage from Nehemiah is, is so important because in it, we can see what God wants from Nehemiah and the people he's brought back to Jerusalem. I see, I must learn to obey him radically so that people will be drawn to the fact that at least in some lives, God is valued above all self-interest. That's what, that's what the people have to see. It's, it's, it's exactly what Jesus meant when he talked about so many things with those that followed him, and he would say this question, what do you do that's more than the others? What do you do more than the others? Well, I don't smoke, I don't drink. Well, lots of people don't. I don't cheat on my wife. Lots of people don't. Atheists don't. But the direction of what I live for are my choices. So Nehemiah addresses these people. And as he does, he presses the core issue of their relationship with God. As you rebuild, don't make the mistake of trying to advance yourself at the expense of your primary devotion to God. That's what he says to the people. You've got bigger things to think about. Don't try to lighten the cost of the work on your own terms. B. Self-denial brings more blessing than self-fulfillment. And I'm wrapping up. Jesus, when Jesus said, lose your life for my sake and the kingdom, I'm paraphrasing, lose your life for my sake and the kingdom and you'll find it. Okay, you know when Jesus said that. And when he said it, he means that there's a sense, there's a sense of discovery here. The way, the way you get the most out of your walk with Jesus won't always be obvious because they'll always be losing something else and you'll feel the pain of that losing if you're going to gain the most in your walk with Jesus. So all these people working on the wall, the same, the same principle. It's like finding something you never thought you'd see again when you consciously actually lose your rights, lose your sense of getting your due, lose any attempt to shore up life on your own terms, live for the kingdom rather than self-indulgence, you, you will find something that you never thought you would find. You might think you're going to be losing things, but you won't be, Jesus says. You're going to find something bigger than anything you lost, but you have to step in. You have to make the risk. You have to make the choice. Here's a spiritual law that is absolutely universal in application in any walk with the Lord. There are no exceptions to this rule. If you just keep doing exactly what you're doing, you will only get exactly what you've already got. Or to put it in biblical terms, you have to sow more to, to reap more. It's the only way to find life eternal. It's the only way to find life eternal. So there you have that 
it's neat seeing those two chapters back to back. Chapter four, where everyone's gathering around and they're threatening them and mocking them. And then chapter five, it, it's just, it's the wear of the job, the toil of the job. The excitement of the start is past. The end isn't there yet. And it's easy at those times to forget that if you, if you want to find life in the middle of that, you can't take circumstances into your own hand. There, there is, you know, I, I don't know crowd like this. I don't know what everyone wrestles with. I know we all wrestle with stuff. And whenever we wrestle with stuff, it's very easy to, without ever meaning to, wrestle in our own strength and, and wrestle on our own terms. And that's what that fifth chapter is all about. Nehemiah has to get them around, get everybody around, you can't do this. I know it looks like this will solve the problem, but you can't do that. You can't do this. That looks like it might work too, but that's not for you. You're following God. God wants to be glorified. 